All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself because I know you're all here for Denise. Um, my name is Katie Auger, and I am the Community Resource Navigator with the Bainbridge Island Senior Center and also with Island Volunteer Caregivers, um, for those familiar with IVC. Um, I am available, even though we're all uh, working, or many of us working from home, but I am uh, happy to set up appointments with folks. We can meet over the phone or schedule a Zoom call. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can get in touch with me uh, just by contacting the Senior Center and they will pass along the message to me and we will connect. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks about different resources available uh, in our community and even beyond. Uh, so feel free. Um, and then I would like to now introduce to you Denise Hughes, who, who is the Dementia Care Specialist with Kitsap County Aging and Long-Term Care Services, uh, so through our county agency. Um, so happy to have you here today, Denise. Um, I'll let you go ahead and maybe share a little bit about yourself, your background, and then um, about your program. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. It's nice meeting everybody virtually here. Thank you so much for having me. As Katie said, I'm the county's dementia care specialist. And as that, I have a contract with Kitsap County through the Division of Aging and Long-Term Care, which is funded by the one-tenth of one percent sales tax grant for Kitsap County to provide services uh, to citizens here of all ages. I'm one of the few contracts that works directly with uh, geriatric folks, and that's you know, age 60 and above, theoretically. So um, so anyway, uh, for 20 years, just my background is I'm a, a nurse. And um, for 20 years, at the end of my career, I worked for Kitsap Mental Health Services as the supervisor of the Older Adult Services Program. And um, as such, I got to know a lot of folks in the long-term care community. And I'm so pleased that there's still such a good uh, amount of collaboration and coordination for services for seniors uh, who live in Kitsap County. Um, I was kind of asked to come out of retirement or whatever it was. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I figured watching the prices right at 11 o'clock in the morning is not a good thing. <laughs> so I needed something more to do. And, um, and I was asked to put together a proposal uh, for this grant. And as such, it, it's been granted and we've reapplied. And so this will be the third year that I'm able to provide services. And my services are, um, I can do consultations individually. When we didn't have the pandemic, I always went to people's homes, which combined a lot of my old work as a visiting nurse. I love being in people's homes when I can. Um, now it's per, almost exclusively um, you know through uh, phone contacts but my the purpose of my consultations is to support caregivers who are taking care of people who have dementia and um, that may be a spouse or it may be you know a parent or even a child so um, we've got all sorts of combinations um, I do I have a master's degree in nursing but I do not prescribe and so I make consultations or I make recommendations to the caregivers um, to talk with their doctors about medication management, about behavioral interventions, about environmental changes, um, about possibly moving to a, a facility um, or trying to you know, help a range of uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy type of, of evaluation to keep a person safe in home and to help the caregivers not burn out because I know how exhausting and how lonely it can be and usually is for most caregivers and especially during these times of isolation just because of the pandemic alone so so it's not it's it's not easy it's and for my role now it's not ideal because i don't get to usually meet with people face to face however i can meet like on somebody's deck or you know outside we can do that if it if it works out you know for for all of us um so so anyway um like i said my goal is to help keep 
people in their homes and keep the caregivers from burning out as much as possible. And I'll talk to you about some of the resources that uh, we've got here in Kitsap County. Um, and that being said, my services are not free, but there's no charge to you as citizens here and residents of Kitsap County, because this is a grant that is received um, uh, to pay for my services. So we have to go through the full process of um, applying to the Citizens Advisory Council, which now we're in the in the process of, it's a little behind schedule as it does its yearly reviews and granting of different uh, grants to different organizations. Um, if so so anyway, we're in the process of doing all of that. And, and I'm hoping, hoping that I'll be able to do this for another year or two. And my goal is to develop it enough so that I can pass it on to some younger nurses or people who would be you know, appropriate and, and have a passion for, um, for serving folks who have you know, dementia and who are caregivers of those. So that's, that's kind of my background in a, in a nutshell. Um, and Katie, you had asked me to maybe talk about different types of dementias as well as resources here in Kitsap County. Is that about it, right? That would be wonderful. And I have a feeling that we'll probably have some questions as well from folks. So if you're open to that, um, oh, yeah. great, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so I guess I'll kind of flip things. I'll start with resources here in Kitsap County. Bainbridge Island is its own little world, which is wonderful because you have so many connections and that have been there for a long time um, and uh, ways of communicating and services for the islanders. But I do want you to know of, of several that if you haven't heard from them, at least you know that they're here in Kitsap County. And the Division of Aging and Long-Term Care, the offices are located in Port Orchard. Um, and um, so they're, they're usually accessible, although all the case managers are, you know, working from home now and doing their Zoom meetings. Um, but that's the, the hub for coordinating the services between long-term care facilities and ambulance services and, and all the business businesses and organizations that provide in-home care, um, organizational services, all of that kind of stuff. They're, they're the hub. And, um, and so they're, um, I encourage you to uh, call them at any time for um, if you have somebody who needs in-home services. And respite services are really tough right now because of the pandemic and because you live at the very north end. And I'll just be really honest with you, there's more services for folks um, in the south end rather than in the north end through the Division of Aging and Long-Term Care. But uh, you Islanders do have are very resourceful and we've got some really cool things I know that have been going on for a long time. Um, so the, the, the basic services are information and assistance um, and then home delivered meals through Meals on Wheels. I know those go up there to be rich at times. Um, there's legal assistance that can um, uh, connect you with uh, the uh, Northwest Justice Project and um, if you um, need an elder attorney, um, which is what I recommend for folks who have uh, concerns about finances and caring for somebody and the long-term care, um, you know, responsibilities of, of, um, of a, a POA. Um, anyway, they, they can help connect you. Some of those services are not free, but, um, but they are uh, vetted and they're, you know, very reliable. There's the caregiver support program, and that's what I'm tightly linked with, which is to care for the caregivers. And so as such, there's normally, you know, conferences that are free. There's services, you know, my services, I can go out and, and all of uh, the case managers and that. But now it's, you know, it's quite different for a while and it will be for as long as you know we're in this pandemic obviously um, but there are still support services for uh, folks and those um, are for people primarily who have Medicaid as their funding source so a Medicaid Medicare combination um, fall under the responsibility of the division of aging to help get services um, in place um, 
And then there, there's connections with Kitsap Mental Health Services. Although they do not have a older adult services program any longer, they are the, the primary um, folks uh, for mental health services in the county. And that includes people of all ages. Um, that's changed a lot, or the, the resources in mental health, community mental health have changed a lot because of the funding streams that, as you know, those change and change and change. And so there are a couple of other uh, resources here in Kitsap County that are available for counseling and mental health services. And to be honest with you, I'm not all that familiar with all of them. So anyway, but it is a kind of a shifting sands. There's a shifting picture here for mental health services. Hopefully it'll broaden them. Um, it will see, you know, I'm always looking for psychiatrists who have a, a practice in geriatrics because Geriatrics is where it's at, and there's so many, you know, doctors who, um, who just, you know, that's not their specialty. So, so anyway, um, and then through the office of the Division of Aging, there's also the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. I don't know if any of you have uh, worked with them or not, but for um, folks who have um, concerns about their their loved one. In nursing home, a boarding home, or a, um, an adult family home. Um, if there's concerns that somebody's going to get kicked out, that they've given notice, that there's problems with our concerns about are they getting their medications on a regular basis, um, and accurately, are there, um, are the meals prepared, you know, on time and, and warm and nutritious are, you know, the, is the environment uh, where they are appropriate and well maintained. All those kinds of concerns can um, be um, addressed through the Ombudsman program. And I'll, at the end of my little spiel here, I'll give you the, the phone number to contact. Um, and, and I highly recommend that if you have concerns, because um, sometimes um, uh, a termination can be, um, you know, overturned and and changed through the ombudsman representing the person who lives in the facility. So it's about the, their rights in the facility, and they will they will go to bat for you with the administration, you know, at these facilities or homes. Um, if, and there's also a, a couple more programs. Um, there's a senior employment program. And so I don't know how active that is at this point in time. All bets are kind of off, you know. Uh, but it is there to help seniors uh, uh, tie into some kind of employment services. And then there's a statewide um, health insurance benefits uh, advisors, and that's Sheba. And so they can help with Medicare programs and, and setting up funding through those sorts of, of resources. So, um, so anyway, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I won't go into all of the programs because I think we can, you know, you can access those yourself. Um, does anybody have any questions about just the basic resources that are here in Kitsap County for seniors? All righty. The phone number to call. Where would you where would you start one? Oh, where would one start? Sorry, where would one start? What? Yes, if I'm if I'm um, if I'm a caregiver of somebody with dementia and I'm trying to figure out what resources are available to me, you've given me a nice long list. Uh, is there a starting <clears throat> point to kind of help me figure out what the first step might be? Yes, and that would be through calling the office, and that phone number is 360-337-5700, that's the main office, and right now during the pandemic, there's a recording, so you leave a message, but a case manager or intake specialist will get a hold of you and um, ask the questions that need to be asked about your concerns, whatever it is that, uh, if it's financial or respite or other kinds of whatever services. Through that office and through that number, you can also make a referral for the dementia specialist, and that would be me. Um, as such, I get a, um, 
an encrypted email. So if you call the office, then they will send me an encrypted email because I work from home. And um, it's all you know HIPAA compliant. And based on that, then I will give you a call and set up a time to chat with you and see if we can do some problem solving around your concerns. I also like to um, coordinate if the referral came to me from one of the case managers or from Adult Protective Services or from law enforcement, whoever makes the referral, I like to get back to them to let them know that I made the referral and if there's any follow-up that they can do with you as the caregiver, then they can, you know, they can do that. So I, I, I try to kind of close the loop there and make sure it all kinds of, kind of um, connects for, for folks here. Because I know that it is so overwhelming to so many folks. Physically, as a caregiver, you get exhausted. Emotionally and mentally, you're juggling all these balls in the air. And, and it's not at all unusual for me to hear from caregivers, I think I've got dementia now because I can't remember where my keys are and I'm doing this or that or the other thing. And I say, well, you know, I think you have caregiver stress dementia because you've got so many things on your plate that you're trying to tend to and, um, uh, you know, get a, get do every day. It just doesn't let up for most caregivers. So, um, so anyway, uh, I try to reassure folks who are in that kind of a situation to give themselves some grace and to help hopefully be able to connect with um, resources that are out there. There are some resources through the Alzheimer's Association, which is very good. It's all, you know, online now. Um, and they've got some great uh, information, very specific things like about if you have to travel with somebody who has dementia, um, whether it's in a car or on an airplane, some good tips, you know, that, that you can access there. Um, and they just have a wide variety of, uh, of services. And, and they also have um, the ability to connect with other caregivers online for support as well as phone numbers where you can have a phone conversation with somebody who can just kind of help you walk through things when you're at your wit's end um, and just need somebody to talk to or you're just, you know, very lonely about the caregiving that you're, that you're experiencing. Any questions or feedback about that type of work? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, so I'll talk about some of the different types of dementia. I guess, who, who else caregivers? Do you want to just raise your hands or put a plug in? Is, are any of you doing active care giving to somebody who has dementia? Okay. Um, one of the things I like about folks on being Ridge Island is there's such independence and, and health. I see so many folks who are physically and mentally very healthy, you know, on the island there. And I, I appreciate you, you know, taking good care of yourselves and taking care of each other. So what I'll do is just go through some of the basics of the different types of dementias and how some of the, I'll just kind of skim on how some of the um, symptoms can be addressed. Uh, but I won't go into a thorough, you know, I mean, it would take days to tackle all the different types of dementias and all the behavioral interventions and that sort of thing that comes out. Um, let's see, I just dropped a little note, excuse me here. I have a little note to sell. Um, so so the, there's several different types of dementia. And dementia is a general term for some type of memory loss. Um, dementia, sometimes the terms get kind of confusing. Well, there's Alzheimer's and there's dementia and then there's, you know, there's cognitive impairment and how do I sort this all out? So I, li I like to frame it as dementia is a, um, you know, is the global um, term for some kind of a cognitive impairment, just change and a decrease in cognitive functioning. Um, there's age-related memory impairment, which I experience as a 70-year-old, and I don't know if any of you do, but, you, you know, it's 
sometimes slower processing things for me. And sometimes, uh, you know, I just don't juggle all the balls in the air like I used to all at the same time and get stuff done. Um, and so those kinds of things are more normal. Normal cognitive impairment um, in as we get older is um, it doesn't really um, really affect our functioning that much. It doesn't interfere with how we function. So we may forget our keys, but we find the other set and we take off and we go on, you know, and do our thing or whatever the situation is. Um, so that's that's very normal, and especially under stressful conditions, it's even more normal to forget more for people of all ages. Um, so that that that's kind of the term, uh, mild cognitive impairment. There's um, I'll start with the first most known uh, dimension. That's Alzheimer's dementia, which is the most common form of dementia that people experience throughout the world. We we are an aging world, um, and so um, you know there's a lot of people who have dementia of some sort, and Alzheimer's is the most prevalent, and that's due to a, a to aging and a shrinking, a global kind of shrinking of the brain itself. Our brains will just get a little bit more shriveled up, like a lot of other things here. And so, um, so that, depending on um, the damage, you know, may take a decade or two to reveal itself. There's studies going on now looking at young people in their 40s, and we're thinking, yeah, we should be preventing dementia when we're in our 40s. But we don't know that we're going to come down with symptoms of it. It's just a real, yeah, it's a real squishy kind of thing at times to you know, to try and, and sort out. And um, and people react so differently, you know, with different dementias. With Alzheimer's, this global change, um, we notice more of a gradual uh, decline in how we're able to to function and how or how our, our partner you know is able to take care of him or herself um, and you may notice you know forgetting names is part of the you know later stages there's early stages of dementia and moderate stages and then the, the later stages where folks need full-time care whether that's at home or in a facility um, and so the the it t anyway, it's it's a longer longer process, I guess I would say. And then there's um, frontal temporal disorders, and there's a whole family of those. And the frontal temporal that's up here and here. So our frontal lobe and our temporal lobes, our temporal lobes have a lot to do with how we. Um, react to circumstances and the emotions and, and frontal lobe uh, changes um, they um, may take many years or some people only two or three years and then there's a big decline in how they're able to take care of themselves and um, manage in the world there's two basic categories of frontal temporal dementia and um, one um, involves changes in behavior and judgment and personality um, and people may have problems just with their their memory uh, their memory may be relatively intact um, but these personality changes are quite confounding to to um, the spouses and family members, um, you know, of, of someone who's experiencing this. Um, the other type of, of frontal temporal dementia involves changes in the ability to speak and understand and express uh, themselves, um, express thoughts. And so um, problems with memory and reasoning and judgment are not apparent at first, but it usually progresses. I have a shirt tail relative who um, became increasingly, um, I don't want to say vacant, just not able to process things anymore. She couldn't um, operate the washing machine. Her husband got really annoyed with her because she always did the washing and now she said that she just you know can't do it anymore. What happens that I, I've seen and have read about is that the, that ability to sequence things is diminishing and so to, to turn to do a load of laundry number one you have to figure out 
what's dirty and what's clean. If then you take the dirty stuff and you take it and you put it in, you take it to the washing machine, you put it in the washing machine, then you close the door and you put in the soap and then you turn on the machine and then you know you take it out of the machine when it's all finished and put it in the dryer. All those processes, all those little bitty things that we don't even think about because we've done them a million, million times, all of a sudden can be very challenging to the person who's got this type of dementia. Um, another woman that I lived with when I was in nursing school, she was up in her 80s, and um, she had been a bookkeeper all of her life, and all of a sudden, she just, her books were a mess, and she couldn't straighten out, um, you know, the math uh, to any of the, the bookkeeping that she was doing, and so um, that was one of, the, one of the signs that she was having some big changes going on in her brain. So anyway, that's, uh, and then there's, um, you know, some other categories of this type of dementia. Um, it picks disease, it picks is another um, uh, brain dementia, and it's more, um, I mean, it's got a little different physiology to it, um, but the, the behavioral personality changes is one of the hallmarks of PICS disease that, um, anyway, that, uh, create changes and problems. Somebody may be very sexually inappropriate all of a sudden, and he was never that way before, or she was never that way before, and now it's a problem. So that's just kind of a, um, you know, can be a heads up that, oh, there's some bigger changes going on here that we need to address. Um, the next kind of uh, dementia that I want to highlight is Lewy body dementia. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. There's so much of it now that's present in literature. And um, Lewy body dementia is the second most prevalent type of dementia um, that people experience uh, under Alzheimer's. And this type of um, this type of dementia can be really confounding to to folks. It's um, it's the changes are in the uh, substantia nigra of the brain, um, but there's two general categories that people usually look at for, for a Lewy body type of dementia, and one is dementia with Lewy bodies, and that's the most uh, common form of this type of dementia. And um, the hallmark signs of Lewy body dementia are visual hallucinations. And these hallucination, hallucinations may be um, disturbing or not. It can be, oh, I see the kids playing out in the yard there. They look like they're getting along okay. Or, oh my God, I see babies burning, you know, burning off out on the lawn or inside the house here in the corner. That's very, very disturbing. But they're visual. It's not a delusion that they're just thinking of something. They're really seeing this. And there are some medications that can help with that type of, of symptom. Um, another feature of Lewy bodies. Lewy body dementia is fluctuating cognition, where um, the person may be fine and be able to, you know, say, for example, um, take care of their their morning their morning routine, brush their hair, brush their teeth, eat a little breakfast, and then do whatever. Um, and then later in the day, they can't even. Uh, recognize who you are and there's a um, you know they they wouldn't know what to do with a comb if, if you handed it to them and then it kind of can roll back and, and so it's very confounding to caregivers because it's like what in the world is going on they could do this in the morning why can't they do it now and it, and it creates a lot of tension in relationships well what's wrong with dad you can't figure something out and um, you know, when he should be able to do this. What's, you know, um, so, so my first experience personally with somebody with Lewy body dementia, and we didn't know it for years, was um, my, with my old boyfriend's father. And his father was a professor of psychology, just a really wonderful person. And and my boyfriend at the time, he, he was majoring, getting his master's in psychology. So anyway, his, his dad started getting really weird. And he would just say these crazy things that came out of nowhere. And he wasn't 
processing things like he used to, but he could still drive the car and still walk around and kind of do whatever. But, but um, I remember my boyfriend just got so aggravated with his dad, you know, and would say, dad, stop it. What do you, you know, what, what's this about? Well, a few years later, about two years later, um, he started, the dad started showing signs of Parkinson's. And the shuffling gait, the pill rolling, the, the mass faces where there just was a very flat affect. And so eventually he, he was diagnosed as having Parkinson's. But the hallmark, the first signs were through changes in his brain. Now, Parkinson's disease and the other, you know, type of Lewy body dementia is somebody who has Parkinson's disease and then they start to lose their memory and have visual hallucinations and have um, these sorts of um, fluctuating cognition um, happen to them through the course of or over the course of their um, their uh, disease uh, you know of Parkinson's and so you can kind of have it either way which is really a yeah. really pretty awful, um, but there are some medications that can help with the visual hallucinations, and they're in the antipsychotic family, and so, um, and those always have to be weighed any type of medication always has to be weighed the risks and the benefits you know with your family doctor is um is, is there hallucinations okay if it's hallucinations are not bothering them let's not treat them however if they're really disturbed and their heart's breaking or they're just just you know so upset um then a category of antipsychotic drugs can be given um usually it's Seroquel, some, one of the newer drugs that it can be given in a very, very, very tiny dose because not much is needed. Um, in fact, um, people who have Lewy body dementia are really hypersensitive to this category of medication. So it can it can create all sorts of other problems, you know, um, including, you know, death. And so you have to be very careful about this type of medication given to somebody who has visual hallucinations due to Lewy body dementia. But looking at the quality of a person's life, is it better that they, that we kind of help tamp down some of these symptoms and you know and they can go about their day and be much more comfortable and you as the caregiver can also be you know have a better day or you know is it just not worth going there so that's a discussion you know with your doctor but it is something that can be it can be addressed and then of course with parkinson's and any of these neurodegenerative diseases it just throws a monkey wrench into all sorts of medical, you know, other medical conditions. And so trying to sort out the levodopa, you know, the doctors have to figure out the levodopa, carbidopa ratios and, and, um, and dosages and all of that. And does that interfere with your other medications? So, and then, then with the dementia thrown in on top of it, it's, it's really complicated. So don't hesitate to see, you know, your doctor about this or neurologist. Neurologist, you can find one. Um, and here in Kitsap County, as you know, we're having some, you know, we don't have enough. We don't have enough neurologists. We don't have, um, I don't, we don't have enough geriatricians. We do have some uh, that, you know, have a, a big caseload. We do not have enough psychiatrists. And these are the folks that can all prescribe and diagnose and, you know, treat these types of conditions. Um, and then the, the last major category of, um, of, um, uh, dementia, I was looking at the clock here going, okay, I want to make sure I wrap this up, is vascular dementia. And vascular dementia is caused by, you know, changes in the, in the arteries. And um, it's a progressive form of, of memory loss and other, you know, the functions that go along with not being able to remember. It can be um, when persons have strokes, um, it's not uncommon for them to develop dementia, um, you know, it may be several months to several years after having had a big stroke. Some people don't. Just like with Parkinson's disease, not everybody develops dementia with Parkinson's disease. Um, and some people who've had strokes 
do not develop dementia, but there is a higher likelihood that that could happen. And so um, taking good care of yourselves to make sure your blood pressure is under control and that um, you've, um, you know, you're, you're taking care of yourself as, as best you can is so important. Um, there's multi-infarct dementia which is little strokes, and these can be due to little clots or little bleeds in the brain. Um, and they are, um, um, they may cause, you know, memory loss and, and more, uh, just more dysfunction. And so, again, um, they there's not a whole lot that can be done for this. But the brain is pretty resilient. You know, years ago when I was, before I was a nursing, it was like, oh, the brain never regenerates. Well, we know a whole lot more about the brain now than we did 40 years ago. And so it's um, it, there is hope that, that there can be some, some help with this. But it's not at all uncommon to, to have some kind of memory impairment and dementia <clears throat> due to a stroke or to little mini strokes. And then the last category, before I open it up for questions, um, I just want to say that there are some reversible forms of dementia. And um, it's maybe a half a dozen or so that are quite, quite common, actually. Um, one is called normal pressure hydrocephalus, and that's water on the brain. Um, often this is from just a genetic a condition that may never have occurred or, you know, or cropped up until we get older and then it's diagnosed. And um, if folks who have um, a lot of fluid on their brains will experience uh, problems with their gait, with walking, and with their bladder and have urinary incontinence and then start to have some kind of dementia. When a shunt is put in and other treatments, you know, through medication is, are applied, that often reverses. Uh, people regain control of their bladders and they um, also uh, regain a lot of their cognitive functioning because the fluid, you know, the pressure from the fluid is not interfering with their, their, their thinking anymore. <clears throat> Another type of um, dementia that's reversible is due to nutritional deficiencies. And this is in usually the B vitamin category, B1, which is thiamine, and B12. And um, often folks who have chronic alcoholism are deficient in the B vitamins. And so having um, um, uh, extra vitamins, usually through IVs at first, and then ongoing vitamin therapy um, helps. Re it can help reverse uh, the uh, the um, the memory loss and the memory impairment. And stopping the alcohol abuse, and this is not just one little glass of wine a day or one drink a day, but but you know a chronic chronic use of alcohol. Uh, stopping that and replenishing the vitamins can often um, um, uh, bring back memory. And it's just pretty amazing. I've seen that happen on numerous occasions. Another cause of a dementia-like disorder is um, some kind of side effect to a medication. And um, and then uh, another is vasculitis and inflammation in the brain, um, a subdural hematoma, which is usually due to a fall and we hit our head and we have a big old, you know, bruise and bleed in our head. When that's treated, you know, then, then um, we don't have the, the symptoms of dementia anymore. Um, brain tumors that are not malignant. And, and then another, um, Another category is just infections, and many of you have, you know, heard um, about, you know, urinary tract infections or a pneumonia causing causing dementia, where you know people just get really confused and wound up, and and someone who has a bladder infection that normally doesn't have any cognitive impairment, and then becomes, you know, all of a sudden they're they're really um, freaked out, stressed out, cannot 
cannot coordinate, cannot think things through, um, those are, are the, that's the kind of that time when, oh, we need to call the doctor and get you right into a doctor. It's that sudden, what I want to explain a little better is it's a sudden onset of confusion and dementia uh, that an, an inflammatory process will cause. So those are kind of the, the, the basics, the down and dirty, I like to call it, of dementias. Um, I'll just open it up for questions or comments. Denise, we did have, um, Anne wrote in asking if you can provide some links for good information on the different types of dementias. Are you familiar yes. with any? Like, sure, great, thank you. Oh, okay, links, okay. I'll do that after the meeting because I don't have them with me too. Okay. And the Alzheimer's Association also has some information, you know, about this. Um, the NIH, National Institute of Health, um, has a lot of good information. Uh, I'll look for the link for that. Thank you. Are there other questions out there? Anybody want to jump in? Hi. Uh, this was way back at the beginning when you mentioned the ombudsman. Yeah. Someone else on one of the calls talked about that. But I was curious. Um, so this person's family member goes and makes the complaint. Is there some protection to the person, to the to the patient, or to whoever who's having the problem that there's not repercussions because of the complaint? The retaliation is always a concern. Yeah, yeah. and and yeah. theoretically, it should never happen. And having the ombudsman in there in that mix you know, really helps, uh, you know, take away that option of retaliation and just, you know, sending a person out. Um, yeah. So I, w I just highly recommend, I, I, I happen to be on the um, long-term care ombudsman advisory council and have been, I don't know, 15 years or more. Um, and it's made up, you know, the ombudsmen are made up of volunteers um, but they know the law, and the law is to protect resident rights. Yeah. And so, so that's always, yeah, I would, I would encourage people not to let that fear of retaliation stop them from contacting the Ombudsman Office. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and again, Denise, the best way to get in touch through the Ombudsman Program is by contacting yeah, that number, that's right, Three, Perfect. 375700. Perfect, thank you. And it looks like we have another question coming in. Um, yes, Jeanette wrote in, have you mentioned Dana Gargis's name? Many of us know oh. her. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Love Dana. And she's so, she took over Gail uh, Health of Kennison's position and um, has continued with this program. And so it's, it's very much alive and well. But the Ombudsman, you know, like the rest of us, can't go into facilities except, well, now it's kind of loosened up a little bit, but, you know, there has been just um, such a, an impact from this pandemic on their services and being able to go in and meet face-to-face -face with people. That is very frustrating for the, the ombudsman. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? Oh, go ahead. Denise? Nope, I just, oh, okay. yeah. Go ahead, Denise. I just want to thank you again. Um, I hope this gives you just a little bit of, of information about kind of what's available. And, um, and don't hesitate to call the office and make a referral to me or it, your friends or family members. Um, my services, like I said, are of no charge. And I do my best over the phone um, and occasionally with outreaches, you know, to people's homes during this pandemic but these services are there for you. 
Great. And Denise, I was wondering, could you quickly explain, um, so when somebody does call you, um, you know, looking for some information or just kind of talking through their situation, what are some of the questions you might ask or what are some things that you're looking for uh, when working with a family or a caregiver? Um, I'm always looking at, well, what is the biggest concern? What's, what's, you know, prompting this call? If it's behavioral, I like to get into the types of behaviors that the person is experiencing. What kind of triggers set off those types of behaviors? Um, <coughs> what has been successful and not successful in dealing with somebody who's having some specific behaviors? And then deal, and then giving suggestions and, and um, resources as far as how do you deal with those types of behaviors. I always like to look at, um, the, at as much of the full picture as I can, getting an idea of what's going on medically with the person. And so diagnoses and histories, um, not super deep, but it really helps give me a better picture of Oh, okay, so this could be impacting that, and that could be impacting that um, kind of uh, thinking that I have. And then the third big category is um, medications. What medications are you taking? What are the doses? What is the time of day that the medications are being given? And is that effective or is it not effective? Is there some other kind of medication that I think you should talk to your doctor about starting or stopping, whether it's an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety medication, an um, antipsychotic type of medication, or, um, or um, an anticholinergic medication. You know, those are the drugs to treat dementia, especially Alzheimer's early onset. Um, and just as a side note, what I've found over the many years of working with these medications and, and folks who need them is that um, the, the, the drugs kind of start to wear off, whether it's denapazil, which is Aricept, Namenda, Exelon, um, there, there's several of them, and, and they can be wonderful and can be very helpful, but that's early on. And often after two to four years of this medication, the brain has just changed so much that it's really not effective. And when I make recommendations for uh, people to talk to their doctor about stopping this category of drug is when the person who's taking it is experiencing a lot more anxiety, a lot more what we call agitation, which you know is you just uncomfortable in your own skin. You can't settle down, and um, and often stopping that medication will help. Will just um, uh, take care of, of those symptoms, and the person may indeed progress a little bit more through their dementia that they're experiencing but they're not as distressed and not as uncomfortable and irritable and, and you know, that they would be if the medication is continued. It's just one of those things anecdotally that I've found over the years. I can tell that those would be symptoms I would have if, if things went south. I feel that sometimes. So Denise, one follow-up question that I had to um, is there, you know, in, in sort of the timeline of things, is there uh, an appropriate time to reach out? So say somebody was, you know, just got a recent diagnosis um, or perhaps they're having concerns that they themselves or a loved one uh, may have dementia and even, you know, on the opposite spectrum, you know, if somebody's had dementia for many, many years. Do you have a, sort of any thoughts on when is a good time to reach out? Bring them on. Yes, okay. <laughs> the sooner the better, um, because it can I can help connect you, and other caregivers can help, or case managers and folks can help connect you with those resources, um, and help uh, help you um, establish a good working relationship with a family doctor if there's you know miscommunication, because sometimes that. You know, the, the caregivers aren't listened to effectively by whoever the providers are. And so how do you navigate through that? Um, I see people at all stages, people who have not been diagnosed yet, but family members are really concerned. There's something wrong here. 
um, and then through all the different stages and sometimes I don't get called in until someone is just about ready for hospice and so I will make that call and say you know I think you need to talk with your doctor now about hospice services and again as a side note hospice should be called sooner rather than later um, they just offer wonderful wonderful support to the families and to the people who have um, you know who are in the later stages of their dementia so so really never a wrong time to to reach out for anyone who's right. having any concerns or thoughts about that yep great that's There's great Two little things about my contract. I don't do crisis outreach. I, you know, I don't do crisis management work, um, and I don't do ongoing case management. My consultations are usually just one, um, but occasionally, you know, when things change and the person who has dementia is having different behaviors or something else is going on that's new, I don't mind a call from the caregiver again. I will certainly. Um, chat with him or her and try and do some problem solving um, regarding that. Again, thank right. you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Denise, so much. And thanks everyone for joining us.